What's up everybody, Noble Comics here. I want to talk about one of my favorite comics. I talked about this about three years ago in an old video, and I don't think I did it very well, so I wanted to redo that here. And this is Karnak, A Flaw in All Things, written by Warren Ellis. It has a few different artists on it, which I'll touch on in a bit, but it is a fantastic read, and I want to get into it. So overall, like I said, very good read. It's got a pretty simple plot, carried by some fantastic art, and it does have an interesting philosophical dialogue from Karnak and some of the other cult members that are a part of this story. It brings an unknown character like Karnak or otherwise unpopular character, pretty much like all the Inhumans, and it really breathes new life into the character, setting up his new status quo like permanently going forward. It's definitely worth reading more than once to appreciate both the story and the art, and some of the philosophical dialogue in here could be easily written off as like, you know, baby's first philosophy class, which I'll talk about. Um, but I do think that given the character and the circumstance that all of this is mentioned in, it is very interesting. I want to start out with the art. Like I said, it's fantastic. The first two chapters are by far the best. Um, it really sells the design of Karnak, the look and feel of the actual story and storytelling of the series. And this is done by Gerardo Zafino, and he is one of the best and most underutilized comic pros out there. Um, his style is sort of this scratchy, unique style. It makes the dramatic scenes very intense and the action very fluid. He's one of the best in the biz. It's awesome. The other chapters are fine. Um, it's like Boshi and Brown. They do a good job, but definitely not to the level of Zafino. And a brief story overview, right? It is quite basic. There's this boy who undergoes teragenesis. He becomes an inhuman, though it seemed to have no effect on him, except that his allergies went away. But then he was kidnapped. Karnak is called in to retrieve the boy due to the politics around humans interfering in inhuman affairs. Um, S.H.I.E.L.D. kind of has its hands tied. And we also introduced to Karnak, right? He's been called in to solve it. He is the Magister of the Tower of Wisdom. And at this tower, he teaches this nihilistic philosophy and doing work for S.H.I.E.L.D. helps to pay the bills, essentially. We also learn about his abilities, which are very unique and cool. He's able to see the flaw in all things, right? People, structures, philosophies, everything. This means that he can like poke a person in just the right spot to rupture their liver. He can see the weak spot in a steel door and punch through it with his bare hands. He was even able to split a bullet in half after it was fired because by the nature of it being fired, it became imperfect. So like, again, he has the perfect touch to destroy anything, but also his mind any argument, philosophy, whatever, he can find the flaw in it. Very cool character concept. Um, it's perfectly utilized here in this type of story. It's very good. Um, but he goes to track down this kid who's been kidnapped, eventually finds out that the kid has more powers than what everyone originally thought. Pretty much whatever you believe about him, he can do for you, right? Anything that you believe is true about the boy is true. Essentially, he's warping reality. Um, and these people think that he's some sort of messiah, but in the end, Karnak is able to stop him and the cult that has grown around him and bring him back in, which I'll talk about in more detail because it ties into the main philosophy of the story, which is sort of the main topic here. But again, overall, the action scenes here are very well written. They're drawn very well. There's very good sections with no dialogue, just letting the images speak for themselves. And it's a very cool and creative ways of taking down the enemies here. Uh, Warren Ellis is a great writer. He does a great job. Now here's the fun part, the real meat of the story and the enjoyment of the comic is through the philosophical debate that Karnak has with himself and other members of this cult that has started around this boy. Like I said, Karnak teaches a sort of nihilistic philosophy that I alluded earlier may seem quite shallow, essentially that nothing matters, right? However, there is more to it than that, and Karnak's own grappling with this reality is interesting to see unfold. Karnak seems to believe that the truth, like capital T truth, is that the universe is cold and uncaring, and because of that, nothing matters. No matter what anyone does or doesn't do, the universe continues on without a care. Uh, even life and death themselves are merely states of being that are essentially meaningless in the grand scheme. He also has a fixation on the importance of nature, specifically calling out stones, right? He's telling his followers, think about these stones, that they are they will last forever, they will outlive you and any human, making them way more important than you could ever be. He also quite often sits in front of some sort of cube, there's a lot of cube imagery here, um, thinking on how this cube is more important than anything else, similar to the stone, right? 
because the cube is pure existence. It is everything that is not nothing. And because of this, it is perfect. He seems to value a type of humility. Overall, right, lower your own perception of yourself to be less important than the rocks of the ground, um, that you're essentially meaningless in the grand scheme of the universe, and that you will never have a real consequence on the world. However, we do see him contradict this quite a bit, as he has quite a high opinion of himself, right? He requires others to not smile at him is one of his things. At one point in the story, he's equating himself to be greater than Satan. Um, and even at one point, he says that he is extraordinary. He obviously has a high opinion of himself. Also, just the fact that he puts himself in the position as a teacher, as a magister, requires you to believe that you are above the people you're teaching and that you have knowledge worth passing on to them. We also see him do things like taking pleasure and causing suffering for others, being very vindictive and cruel, like he requires the parents of the kidnapping boy to pay him by giving him the possession from which they have come to the conclusion that like life is worth living essentially, which is a very cruel thing to do and it ends up being a picture of their happy family together where they had like a great day. And like that was the realization that you know life is good so he wanted to rob them of that as sort of a lesson to teach them that no like everything sucks essentially and i feel like you can't really be humble if you take joy in the petty suffering of others i, I feel like those two things just can't coexist we also see him telling himself like he's on the helicarrier and he's thinking like you know i could take this whole thing down in one touch if i just wanted to which obviously right is having a high perception of yourself and he has a lot of other things that I'll mention as I go on. So we can clearly see that Karnak is preaching a message that he may believe, but he doesn't quite behave as if he does, which you could say is the definition of disbelief. And so the most interesting parts of the book, and which shine a light on Karnak as a character the most, are points when others dare to challenge Karnak's belief, because he often does not argue back or state new points. He obviously is not very comfortable in his own belief, as he just usually kills the other person. It's like he is unable to allow someone who would make him reconsider his belief to live. We see this with this gardener character who declares that the boy is the philosophy, this chosen boy. He is the philosophy, he is the key. He completes everyone's worldview, including Karnak. He's gonna complete your worldview and he's the key to all, which of course makes Karnak have to give this other person the reins to his life and his belief and everything, which he cannot do because he's incredibly self-centered, you know, have to believe that this boy's own philosophy is superior than his own philosophy, which he cannot do. And hearing that, right, was too much, and he, he kills the gardener, who was trying to kill him too, in all fairness. There's also the painter, who, more than anyone else, outright challenges Karnak, stating that his philosophy is a sham, that he believes everything is meaningless because he's too scared to consider the alternative. He's been sheltered all his life, denied Terragenesis as a child, robbed of that control, and because of that, he's been trying to gain control his whole life. Karnak had to work every day to prove himself and to become this perfect, flawless being, but that's not possible. Um, everyone has flaws. This is what the man is talking about. And those flaws and the challenges that come with them is where strength and wisdom come from. That is what gives life meaning. Experience in the world and accepting its nature brings better wisdom than anything that Karnak could teach in his tower, and that does terrify him, so he rejects it. This is actually pretty similar to that conversation between Robin Williams and Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting, but that's beside the point. For Karnak, it's easier to believe that no one is special, and that everything is meaningless, right, than to try and face the reality that there's a lot out there in the world that can give it meaning, and there's lots out there that require, you know, vulnerability in order to face, and so he simply turns away from it. He's, he's cowardly, cowardly towards it. And then finally, there is the boy himself, right? The quote unquote Messiah. And his thing is he gives people what they want. He changes people who want to change, like the painter, like the gardener. He seems to be the opposite extreme of Karnak's belief. Here, everything and everyone matters. Everyone should get what they want. Everyone should be granted whatever they wish. And to Karnak, this is disgusting. That nothings, these people who are nothing, are given power, granted wishes, it goes against his very perception of the nature of the universe. And it is a pretty good ideological contrast between like pure humility, if not nihilism, and then, you know, sort of a hedonistic, if not redemptive mentality. I thought it was very interesting. But in the end, Karnak once again 
dwells to the depths of sort of pettiness and vengeance. As he does defeat the boy, he sees the flaw in his brain that gave him his powers and he removes it, but then also he delivers a cathartic blow, turning the boy into a vegetable for daring to challenge his own belief. It is clear that Karnak struggles with his own beliefs, right? And perhaps his role as a teacher is to sort of validate his own feelings by surrounding people who trust his word and believe as he does. Clearly though, he does have doubts, and this is the only explanation for why he would lash out at people who would challenge him, right? Only people who know that their beliefs are a sham would do something like that. So what is wrong with Karnak's belief? At its core, it is essentially true and could be beneficial, right? The universe is fast and it is indifferent to any individual. Whatever you do today or for your entire life will have no effect on the universe as a whole um, the, the world out there is just much bigger than you, right? So get out of your own head, all that, that's fine. Also, it can be said that pride is the heart of all vice, and so humility is at the heart of all virtue. So being humble, humbling yourself allows you to serve others, put the needs of others before your own, but Karnak wants to humble people like lower than that. He wants to humble everyone down to this level of almost despair and nothingness where no action they do has any benefit or meaning. He rejects any concept of love or beauty or pain and suffering when it comes to overcoming these things. Really, he robs any human experience of having meaning, which of course it does. These things require vulnerability, introspection, and change, which Karnak is incapable of. He knew exactly who he wanted to be when he was a child, he was bitter about being normal, and it drove him towards finding the flaw in everything else, and forced him to sort of stick his head in the sand and hide away from other realities of the world, having a much simpler and negative worldview. Again, we can't really blame him for this outlook when his powers are literally seeing the flaw in everything and everyone, and the realization that nothing is pure and perfect, except maybe his cubes, could lead you to think that nothing is worth preserving or caring about. We see this conflict within himself over his beliefs in his actions, right? He is obviously prideful, spiteful, bitter, petty, um, despite claiming that, well, everything's meaningless, nothing matters, who cares? So obviously there is a disconnect. And the way that the boy went around it, right, granting wishes to everyone, that's also bad. Um, total freedom to do and have anything you want never ends well, and it is a corrupting force on the boy. Like they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we do get a glimpse of this towards the end, where the boy, he turns some of his followers into spider people to fight Karnak. Uh, but he insists, no, it's for their own good. Like, spider culture is good. It's for their own good. So clearly, neither of these mentalities are particularly healthy or, or proper, right? Um, there is one interesting point, though, where everything that I mentioned so far is kind of thrown out of whack. And there's a, there's a scene where Karnak is talking to this waitress in Germany, and he's talking to her about the three worlds. He explains that one world is our world, as in where we are now, and who you care about. This is like your immediate day-to-day -day life, your friends and your family, just like your place in the world. There's also the world, as in the actual scientific, biological, and physical world in which we live in, and both of those are simple enough. But then he tells the waitress that she is a world, that she is perfect and eternal and part of the whole no matter what were to happen, and that only true understanding of the cosmos comes through her. This is weird. It seems to contradict the notion that nothing matters, and more so contradict Karnak's entire worldview that everything is flawed. He literally calls her perfect. It would indicate that there is some universal, undeniable, unchanging truth and reality, which again goes against his nihilistic outlook and his specific ideas about human nature and its role in the universe. It seems like he is perhaps talking about the soul, right? That it's eternal. It leads to true understanding of the cosmos as it would point to a true afterlife or spiritual structure and importance, perfect by its own nature, existence within the self. But how could that be reasoned against everything that he has said before this point and after this point? This has always bothered me and I don't know how this is rationalized, but maybe that's the point. That cold, logical Karnak who has it all figured out is irrational and perhaps does have this cognitive dissonance. I think we know this is true, based on everything I pointed out until now, but it is weird seeing him be so cognizant of it. Because again, this worldview that he has, this very negative nothing matters worldview, whenever it is challenged by 
talking about things like experiencing the joys and suffering of life, being willing to change and grow as a person, all of that he rejects usually violently as if the thought of a contradicting philosophy drives him crazy that he cannot exist with it. Yet right here, he seems to talk about it in a very like calm, almost happy way, like this is a good thing, but it seems to go against everything. It's very strange. But with all that said, I will tell you this, go read Karnak the Flaw in all things. It's definitely worth it. I didn't go into all of the spoilers here as far as the story and the art goes. Definitely go check it out. It's worth, you know, multiple reads. And this would probably be the perfect comic if Safino drew the whole book. Just going to say it. Um, I'll also leave you with a question, whether you read it or not. What do you think the third world is? What does that mean? And how does Karnak interpret that within his own belief system? Let me know in the comments and I will see you in the next one.